This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them later. Hi there everyone. 2023 is shaping up to be a fantastic year for FPV. The HD0 goggles just launched, we've got tiny digital 1S VTXs and Betaflight 4.4 just released as well and we're only a couple of months in. I wanted to create a tuning guide for Betaflight 4.4 not only for new pilots who are getting into FPV for the first time but also for those of us already skilled in the art. Now, most tuning guides will focus on a quad like this, a 5-inch freestyle quad. And that's fine, but I wanted to do something a little bit different with this guide. So today we're going to be looking at this. This is the Sub 250 Nanofly 20, and it's a tiny 2-inch 1S digital quad. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this quad, I am going to be doing a review of it. So make sure you're subscribed, hit the notification bell so you don't miss that when it comes out. There's a couple of reasons that I wanted to focus on a tiny quad like this for the tuning guide. The first is that often new pilots won't start off with a five inch quad, they'll start off with something small and lightweight like this. And secondly, this is actually a really difficult type of quad to tune in Betaflight because the defaults in the firmware are not set up for a quad of this size. And when we make things a little bit more challenging, I think we get to learn a little bit more about the tuning process as well. In this video, I'm going to be taking you through everything you need to know to get a quad like this, or any quad really, tuned up in Betaflight 4.4. We're going to be going through a checklist of things you need to make sure you've done before you start tuning, as well as every step of the tuning guide. And I'm also going to be giving you some of my tips and tricks along the way to help you get those last few percentage points of performance out of your quad. It's a lot to cover in one video, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. Let's dive right in with our pre-tuning checklist. So before you start tuning, you're going to want to check that you have a flyable quadcopter with Betaflight 4.4 or 4.3 installed on it. You're going to want to make sure you have black box logging present on your flight controller, that it's a feature that your board has and that it's enabled and working correctly. You're also going to want to check that you have bi-directional D-Shot enabled and I would recommend BL Heli32, AM32 or BlueJ firmware on your ESCs and that will be the case for most new quads, they'll have one of those. You want to make sure that you have your correct radio preset applied, and I'm going to take you through the process to apply that now. And you also might want to see if you can have your Betaflight OSD set up and working. This isn't essential, but it can make it much easier to change your PID parameters from the OSD menu and not have to keep plugging and unplugging your quad from the computer to change every setting. If you've got all of those checklists ticked off, we can dive right into the pre-flight configuration and then onto the tuning. All right, so we've gone through our checklist and we have everything we need. Now we're gonna jump into Betaflight Configurator to get the quad set up for tuning. Now, there are gonna be links down in the video description to all the software and versions that I'm gonna be using in this guide. So this is Betaflight Configurator. We're gonna to connect to the quad over USB and then we're gonna check just a couple of settings. The first is we're going to check that bidirectional D-Shot is enabled in the Motors tab. So this is bidirectional D-Shot here. We just might want to check if that is unticked, we are going to need to tick it, make sure that it's active. And then the second thing we're going to want to check is that black box logging is set up. So we're going to want to set black box logging device to onboard flash if you've got a flash chip on your flight controller. Or if you've got a serial port logging device, you're going to want to select that. But for most people, it's going to be an onboard flash chip. We're going to be logging at 2 kilohertz, and we're going to be using the gyro scaled debug mode. Once that's all set, hit save and reboot. And also, you might want to just check that you've got free space on your data flash chip. So if you've already filled that up because you've done some flying already, just make sure you erase it. Start from a clean slate for the tuning. Before we start tuning the quad, it's really important to apply the correct preset for our radio link. So to do that, you can go to the presets tab and then search for your radio link. So I'm using Express LRS and you can see that we have a bunch of different frequencies for Express LRS. I know I'm running 250 Hertz, which I think is the standard. And then we have a list of options in here. This will tell you something about the type of flying that you want to do with the quad. So if you're looking for racing, you can select racing. I'm going to be doing freestyle with a digital system, so I'll select HD freestyle. And with my RX connection method, this is a SPI receiver, so I'll select a SPI receiver. If you're using a separate serial receiver, you would obviously select that. 
and which voltage telemetry readings you want. I'll take single cell values and that should be all you need to do. Then you can just select pick and save and reboot will apply that preset and that will configure things like RC smoothing and feed forward filtering to make sure that your radio link is correctly set up for your quad. Now that you've got the quad all set up, you're ready to start the tuning process. And the tuning process is the same, whether you're tuning a tiny 1S micro quad or a big eight inch Cinelifter and anything in between, the process is the same, but the values that you're gonna find that are right for the quad are gonna be very different depending on the different sizes of quad that you're tuning. We're gonna start with the filter tuning. Now, this is really important. We have software filters in Betaflight that remove a lot of the noise from the motors and the props, and we need to configure them correctly so that the signal that's getting through to the PID loop is really clean, really smooth. So we're gonna be tuning those filters. We're gonna be trying to find a configuration with the minimum delay that gives a really clean signal into the rest of the PID loop. We can do that in angle or acro mode, and we're gonna do it with throttle pumps as we're gonna see. Then we're gonna to move to tuning the PD balance and the master multiplier. Now you can actually do these in either order. Um, and often you'll do a bit of PD balance, then a bit of master, and then go back and do a bit more PD balance. And you'll kind of go through that loop a few times until you find the right PD balance and the right master multiplier setting for that quad. We're gonna be doing all this in angle mode. Angle mode makes it a lot easier to tune PD balance because angle mode disables feed forward, so we don't need to worry about that. And it also means that we can do fast left right wobbles and front back wobbles on roll and pitch very easily without risk of crashing the quad. It really does make things a lot simpler. Once we've found PD balance and master multiplier, we're gonna move on to tuning feed forward to give a really excellent response to stick inputs in acro mode. So if you're always gonna fly in angle mode, you don't actually need to tune feed forward. But if you're flying in acro mode, we're gonna tune feed forward to get that perfect response to stick inputs. And then we're gonna finish off with some tips and tricks to fine tune the quad and get the best performance out of it. So that's the process all the way through. Let's dive in and start with filter tuning. When we're tuning the filters, we need a particular type of log where we're using the full range of throttle on the quad. A common mistake that I see some people make is they do a tuning flight where they cruise around always at the same throttle position. That's not very useful for tuning. We need to see throttle pumps all the way to 100%, all the way back down to 0%. The easiest way to do that is in angle mode, and you can do it inside if you've got good throttle control, but it's often easier outside where you've got more space. And you just increase the throttle smoothly all the way to 100%, and then back it all the way down to 0%, and do that a few times, and that's gonna give us a great log for looking at the filter tuning. Once you've done your tuning flight with lots of throttle pumps, you need to get the log off the flight controller so that you can analyze it on your computer. Now, the easiest way to do that is to go into Beta Flight Configurator, connect to the flight controller, go down to the black box tab and activate mass storage device mode. And that's gonna reconnect the flight controller as a mass storage device. And then you can see your log files here and just copy them across to a folder on your computer to analyze later. My favorite tool for analyzing log files for filter tuning is Blackbox Explorer. I'll put a link in the video description to this tool. When you open it, you'll be able to open a log file and we can select our throttle pumps log here. And once that loads in, we'll be able to analyze that in Blackbox Explorer. Now in this little box here, you might have several sub logs within your log, depending on whether you've armed or disarmed the quad multiple times. Select the one that you wanna analyze. And as you can see here, we have lots of throttle pumps all the way up and down the throttle range. And we can analyze that by clicking gyro scaled roll. And that will bring up this analyzer window. And what we're gonna to want to do is go to the top left and select the frequency versus throttle plot here. You then may need to click away, click on something else and then click back to show the frequency versus throttle plot. So this is what we have for my quad. You can see I didn't quite get all the way to 100%, but I got up to about 80% throttle or so. That will be good enough for what we wanna do here. You may also see these horizontal lines. Now these, a lot of people are confused when they see these. 
If you see horizontal lines like this in your log, that indicates that you bumped something or you crashed during that flight. And if you trim that bump away, so we can use the I and the O keys on the keyboard to trim away the bump. So we'll trim away the end of the log and we'll trim away the start of the log. And you can see that that improves a lot of those horizontal lines. I clearly still bumped something at least once during the flight here because we still have some horizontal lines, but generally you can ignore them because they're usually due to crashes. So how do we go about determining the correct filter configuration for this quad? Well, we do it by looking at this plot here. So this is frequency versus throttle. We have zero to a thousand hertz on the X axis and zero to 100% throttle on the Y axis. So what we can see is how the noise, the vibrational noise of the quad changes with throttle position. We can see that we have this big sweep here. This is motor noise. And we can see that the frequency of the motor noise increases with increasing throttle, which makes sense. The faster the motor spin, the faster the prop spin, the higher the noise frequency, and also the more noise there is. You can see that the plot gets brighter up towards the top. If we turn on show all filters in this menu, we can see all of the filters that are currently being applied. We have a gyro low pass filter from 250 hertz up to 500 hertz. And we have a D-term low pass filter from 150, from 75, sorry, up to 150. And a second low pass filter at 150 hertz as well. So we have three filters applied on pitch and roll. And we also have a your low pass filter at 100 hertz. So four filters applied in total. And most quads do not need that many. For most quads, we're gonna be looking to turn off all of the gyro filtering, run just one D-term filter, and that's gonna be all that we need. We're still gonna have RPM filtering and dynamic notch filtering in beta flight, which help target motor and frame resonances specifically but the low pass filters, we're not gonna need any on the gyro and we're only gonna need one on the D-term. To help guide you towards the right frequencies to set for your cutoffs, I put this table together. When we're choosing a low pass filter for our D-term, we're trying to place the cutoff between two things. On the low side, we have flight movement and prop wash frequencies. So that's the real movement of the quad that we want the PID controller to respond to and those tend to occur up to about 50 or 70 hertz. And then above that, we have motor noise, and we wanna filter all of that out because it's not to do with the movement of the quad. So we have these two things, and we wanna place our cutoff in the middle. Add to that the fact that we want our cutoff to be as high as possible so that the filter adds as little delay as possible. That will allow the PID controller to respond faster. Now, in my experience, these filter cutoffs are going to be pretty suitable for most quadcopters of that prop size. So hopefully this will give you a good starting point. But you can and should experiment with moving those frequencies up and down to see if you can get away with a little bit less filtering. So higher cutoff frequencies for less delay. Or if you have a quad that's a little bit noisier, you might want to move those cutoffs down a little bit just to attenuate that noise a little bit more and move them up or down in steps of, you know, about 10% and see how you get on. This is part of tuning, it's experimenting with what you can do with your build to get the best performance out of it. To set up our filters, we're gonna go into the PID tuning tab and then the filter settings tab. And this is giving us all of our filter settings. Now, remember that I said that most quads don't need gyro low pass filtering. So we're gonna turn off gyro low pass one in the vast majority of cases, and that's gonna be absolutely fine. Coming over to our D-term low pass, this is where we're gonna be making some changes from the default to get lower delay and slightly better filtering. To do that, we're gonna turn off the profile dependent filter settings so that we can adjust this. We're gonna be turning off the second D-term low pass filter and setting the first D-term low pass to biquad type. That's very important, it needs to be a biquad the biquad gives more filtering um, than a typical PT1, so you can get away with just a single biquad. Then we have our minimum and maximum cutoff frequencies, and that's gonna come from looking at the log, our experience, and also from that table of recommendations that I showed you earlier. So for this size of quad, I'd recommend starting with something like 100 
and 125 hertz for those two. And the dynamic curve expo, we can leave at five. We can also leave the your low pass filter on. That helps just avoid noise from the your axis coming in to affect pitch and roll. Your is a very slow axis to respond, so there's no uh, penalty really for having additional filtering there. Once we've set our filters up, we just hit save and that's all done. All right, so now we've configured our filters correctly, it's time to look at the PD balance and the master multiplier. And before I dive into how we're gonna tune them, I wanna tell you a little bit about the P term, the D term, what they do, and the effect that the master multiplier has. Now, the analogy that I'm gonna use for this is car suspension. So in car suspension, you have a spring and you have a shock absorber. The spring is there to return the suspension to the middle position when you go over a bump, and the shock absorber is there to soak up the energy of that bump so that the car doesn't continue to kind of bounce along the road. The P term in our PID loop is like the spring in that suspension system, and the D term is like the shock absorber. So in a car suspension, if you have too much spring, too much P term, when you go over a bump or you get a sharp, in sharp input, the car will continue to bounce along the road for a while. The same is true of our quads. If we have too much P term, the quad will continue to kind of oscillate after a sharp input for a while. If you have too much D term in suspension, the car takes a long time to react. It's very slow and wallowy. And exactly the same is true of our quads. If you have too much D term, too much shock absorber compared to the P term, the quad is very slow to react. And it's not the value of each of these in isolation that's important. It's the balance between them. It's the ratio between them. So there is an ideal PD ratio, an ideal PD balance, and that's what we're going to be looking to find. The second part of this is the master multiplier. Now, the master multiplier is about the stiffness of the suspension overall. So the higher the master multiplier, the stiffer the suspension and the faster the quad is going to react. But if your PD balance is correct, increasing the master multiplier isn't gonna change the shape of that response. It's not gonna make it start bouncing if it wasn't before. So what we wanna do is we want to find the right PD ratio and we want to increase that master multiplier to stiffen everything up and make the quad react really nice and quickly to sharp stick inputs and also react really nice and quickly to things like prop wash or turbulence in the air which might disturb the, the quad so that it doesn't end up wobbling or shaking when we're flying. Now to do that, we need to do a different type of tuning flight to what we've done before. With this tuning flight, we're going to be in angle mode. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, angle mode makes it a heck of a lot easier to, to rock quickly left and right and forward and back, which is what we need to do to tune PD balance. And also angle mode disables feed forward in the flight controller and that's great because feed forward, we need that disabled in order to see the response of our P and D term clearly in the logs. So we're going to do about 20 seconds of flight for each of these logs, rocking left and right, rocking forward and back. Again, just about 20 seconds or so, land, and then adjust the PD balance, adjust the master multiplier and fly again and produce a range of logs that we can compare. Before we start tuning for PD balance, it can be really helpful to turn off the I term in the PID controller. That way we know that nothing that we're seeing is due to the I term. So let's go into the PID tuning tab, enable expert mode up in the top right, and then take this drift wobble slider and turn it all the way down to zero. That will make sure that when we're looking at the step response later on, we know that the only terms that are active are the P term and the D term. Go ahead and hit save, and then we can move on. When you have to take logs at a bunch of different PID slider positions, there's a trick that's going to save you a heap of time. Rather than plugging your quad into the computer to adjust the slider value each time, you can actually do it in the Betaflight OSD menu. If you've never used the Betaflight OSD to adjust your PID slider settings, it couldn't be simpler. While the quad's disarmed, just center your sticks, your left pitch forward. You can then move up and down using the right stick and select by rolling to the right. So we'll select profile, go to simplified tuning, select that, and we can see all of our slider settings here. The main ones we're gonna be adjusting are the P and I gains, 
and the master multiplier. Once you've selected the settings that you want, you can go back, you can go up to roll round to the bottom to select back, and again, save and exit, and save and exit. Once we have all of those logs captured, it's simple to load them into PID Toolbox and compare the step response to find our ideal PD balance and ideal master multiplier setting. So here is the step response for the logs that I've loaded into PID Toolbox for my tune. So I've taken a whole range of different values for the PI slider whilst keeping everything else constant. So we can see the effect of changing the PI slider value from 0.3 all the way up to 1.5. And this is directly affecting our PD balance because as we increase the PI slider, we're having more P term, but the D term is staying the same. And what we can see is that with a PI slider value of 1.5, we have this really underdamped response, a big overshoot. It overshoots to 1.5 and then comes back and it bounces around a little bit. The oscillation is actually more visible, I think, on the pitch axis here. And also in that light blue trace, you can also see some oscillation. Conversely, if we have the PI slider at 0.3, you can see how slow it, the quad is to respond and how long it takes to get to 1.0 that's also not good. That means the quad is kind of wallowing around. It's very slow to respond to stick inputs and prop wash. The ideal would be if the trace just rose up to 1.0 without overshooting and without any oscillation. And the closest that we've got to that here is I think 0.4 on the PI slider, this red line. You can see it rises up. There's a tiny overshoot, but I mean, that could be just in the margin of error. There's not very much overshoot there at all. And then it doesn't really oscillate around very much. It stays nice and flat. So the right value for this quad is a PNI slider value of 0.4. Now, remember I said that we are looking at PD balance. So what we're actually interested in is the ratio between the PI slider and the D slider. So we know that we have a PI slider of 0.4 and a D slider of one. So we need to make sure that our D slider is always 2.5 times as much as our PI slider. And that will make sure that the PD balance always stays correct, even as we change the master multiplier or overall gain on all those terms. All right, so now let's look at the master multiplier. And here we're gonna keep the PI slider constant at 0.4, keep the D slider constant at 1.0. So we're maintaining the correct PD balance and we're just increasing that master multiplier from 1.0 all the way up to 2.0. And you can see the effect this has on the tune. So at 1.0, everything is pretty slow. It's kind of wallowy. It takes a long time to get to 1.0, the response that we want. As we increase that master multiplier up to 2.0, this bright green curve, you can see it's much faster. It really gets up to 1.0 quite quickly. And the difference is even bigger on the pitch axis, actually. We see that it, the green curve really gets up to 1.0 quickly. And that's the benefit of increasing the master multiplier. It stiffens everything up. It makes everything faster, more responsive. And that's going to give overall a better flight feel. Um, it's going to feel more locked to your sticks like that. If you're turning up the master multiplier on a really small quad, you might run into a situation like I have here, where I have my master multiplier at 2.0. I want to increase it further and I, I just can't. I've not got any more room on the slider. If you get into that situation, there's a really simple fix. All you're going to do is take your D gain slider and double it. So go from one to two and your P and I gain slider and double it. So from 0 0.4 to 0 0.8. And then you can turn your master multiplier back down to 1.0 because you've doubled the two sliders and then you've halved the master. So you're back to where you started. Now you have the ability to continue to raise that master multiplier to get the quad to perform even more quickly in response to your stick inputs. So now that we've reached the end of the PD balance and master multiplier tuning, I wanted to show you a before and after for this little quad. So this bright red line is the factory tune. You can see that it's it's got a lot of overshoot. There's some oscillation after it. it it's not great. After we've tuned the PD balance and we've turned up the master multiplier, you can see that we have a response that's just as fast. In fact, maybe even a little bit faster, but no overshoot. And the quad just responds up to 1.0 and then goes flat from there. That's exactly what we want to see. And if you're seeing a curve like this dark red one here, that means that your PD balance and master multiplier look to be pretty well tuned. So now we can move on and start to look at feed forward. 
Once you've finished tuning PD balance and turning up the master multiplier, you can go ahead and return the iGain slider to 1.0. We're not going to talk about iTerm tuning in this video because in general for almost all quads, the iTerm at 1.0 is going to be absolutely fine. iTerm has a really wide tuning window in Betaflight and it's not involved in the fast response of the quad, which is what we care about when we're tuning. That said, if you want to take a few logs with different i slider values and see how the quad behaves and see if you can see any difference in the logs or in the step response, then I would certainly encourage that as well. Now let's talk about feed forward. And feed forward is something that really sets Betaflight apart from other flight control firmwares. Betaflight's treatment of feed forward is the most advanced as far as I'm aware, and it's responsible for some of the advantages Betaflight has in terms of flight performance. Feed forward looks at the speed at which you're moving the sticks, the rate of movement of the sticks, takes that and inputs it into the PID loop to push the quad in the direction that you want it to go as you move the stick. Now this allows you to reduce the delay between the stick movement and the movement of the quad to near zero. And that gives a fantastically locked in feel, especially for racers. To tune feed forward, we're gonna be doing a similar type of tuning flight to what we did for PD balance and the master multiplier, but this time we're gonna be in acro mode. So you might want to do this outside so you've got a bit more space. Again, we're going to be doing fast wobbles left and right and fast wobbles forward and back, this time in acro mode. We're going to be taking logs at a bunch of different feed forward positions. And once we have a lot of different feed forward slider positions, we're going to load that into PID Toolbox or Blackbox Explorer and have a look at the delay between the set point and the gyro to figure out what amount of feed forward is right for this particular quad. Here are the results from my logs. You can see that because we've tuned PD balance and we've pushed the master multiplier already up really high, there's not much delay to begin with between the set point, what we're telling the quad to do with our sticks in the red, and the movement of the quad, the gyro in the black. So when we add a bit more feed forward, so we turn the slider from zero up to 1.0, we see a bit of a reduction in delay, but it's not very much. By the time we push it up to 1.5, we do see that the delay has been reduced to near zero on average, and that's where I decided to stop here. The value of feed forward that you land on is gonna depend on your other gains, especially D gain. So if you have very high D gains, you might expect to need more feed forward to get the same effect. Feed forward obeys this law of diminishing returns. So if you start increasing feed forward from zero and you're seeing a good effect, keep going. But if that effect stops happening and you stop seeing any benefit from increasing feed forward even higher, then it's best to leave it there. Very high values of feed forward can amplify jitter from your RC link um, and from your sticks and can also cause overshoots on sharp moves as well. Not all quads are going to be able to reduce the delay between stick input and quad response to zero. It's going to depend on the size of the quad and your rates as well. So if you have a large quad or you're running high rates or both, you may not be able to use feed forward to get the delay all the way to zero. But once you start seeing the motors hitting 100% on those sharp moves, that's when you know that there's nothing more the quad can do and there's little point to increasing feed forward beyond that. Now that you have your quad tuned correctly, I'm just gonna share with you a couple of final tips and tricks to get the maximum performance out of it. One setting that can make a real difference to how your quad performs is dynamic idle. You can find it on the PID tuning tab under dynamic idle value, and it basically limits the minimum RPM that the motors will ever spin down to during a fast flip or roll, or in prop wash situations, it can provide a big benefit to the stability of your quad. Now to calculate the correct dynamic idle setting for a particular quad, we need to know its prop size. I've produced this table to help you calculate what the correct dynamic idle setting is for your quad. So to calculate the dynamic idle RPM, a good place to start is 15,000 divided by the prop diameter in inches. That's gonna give you an RPM of 3,000 for a typical five inch or 7,500 for a two inch quad like I'm tuning today. Then to get the setting for dynamic idle, you divide that RPM by 100 and then round it to the nearest number. Once you know what the correct setting for your quad is, you can enter it in this dynamic idle value here. So I'm just gonna enter 75 and then hit save. And 
for a lot of quads, that will provide a big benefit to flight performance. And I think it's a setting that is often overlooked in other tuning guides as well. The final setting that we're going to talk about is RC smoothing. And you can find that on the receiver tab, and it's down here. RC smoothing allows you to separate the stick feel of the quad from the pid tune. So you can have a very tight pid tune and still have the quad feeling very smooth on the sticks. And that's what a lot of cinematic pilots particularly are looking for. To adjust RC smoothing, you're going to want to set the set point cutoffs to auto and then just adjust this auto factor. If you've applied a preset for your radio, that will give you something that's suitable initially. You could either increase that auto factor or reduce it, and then that's going to give you a smoother quad response if you increase the auto factor, or a sharper, more race-like quad response if you decrease that auto factor. If you're applying a preset for your radio link, you may also have some options for what types of flying that you want to do. That's going to adjust that RC smoothing factor, um, so you might be able to get this effect by applying the correct preset for your radio link as well. And that brings us to the end of the video. I've taken you through my tuning method and I've shown you some tips and tricks that will help you get the maximum performance out of your quad. Today, we tuned a little two inch micro, but you can use exactly the same procedure to tune any size quad in Betaflight 4.4 or 4.3 from a tiny whoop all the way up to a 13 inch beast class or even bigger. The sky really is the limit. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like button so that other people find it more easily. And if you want to see more content like this on Betaflight, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit that notification bell. Now it's time for a word from the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Whether you're looking to improve your skills to advance your career or to support your hobby, Brilliant.org is a fantastic way to learn maths, science and computer science skills interactively. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from topics ranging from foundational maths to advanced physics and even AI, neural networks and machine learning, with new courses being added every month. For understanding how drones fly and move through the air, a course like Classical Mechanics can be really useful. Brilliant will teach you these concepts through the medium of interactive lessons and will also give you quick questions to check your understanding. Perfect. Whatever your goal, Brilliant makes learning easy and fun, and their bite-sized lessons mean that you can make progress in just a few minutes each day. If you'd like to try everything Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days, then visit brilliant.org slash chrisrosser or click the link down in the video description. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.